Good morning. It's great to be here with you. I can't think of a thing that I'd rather do than to meet with God's people, to worship, to encourage one another, and spend time building one another up. I realize uh, that this is the first time I've had the opportunity to preach a sermon from our new auditorium. Uh, it's uh, great. I want to take a moment to thank uh, those that have filled in so uh, well for all of us uh, the last few months, from Buddy to Dave to uh, Jonathan to uh, Alex and to Steve and the effort they put in. Uh, so it's my turn tonight or this morning. Um, got short notice on this, so I decided to spend my time this morning, our time together, speaking about something that I'm very uh, familiar with, uh, and that's some of my struggles and my uh, work to get overcome those struggles to um, handle them in a way that would be pleasing to God. 22 months ago, on March 11th, 2019, Janie had a knock on the door, and we were served papers, uh, and she got pretty stressed over that, uh, gave me a call, my phone rang, I was in the middle of a meeting, so I sent her to voicemail directly, three seconds later, my phone rang again, it was Janie, so I still wasn't done with the meeting, so we sent her to voicemail again, could not get away from that phone call. It was a phone call that changed my life, uh, lots of turmoil and stress in my life. Our life was basically turned upside down. Up to that point, things were going well. We were running a moderately successful growing business, and all of a sudden, because of this door knock, this phone call, this uh, being served papers, we were concerned that we might lose everything that we'd worked our lives, all our personal possessions. Our business might not make it. Uh, there were a lot of people counting on us, including friends, family, uh, to be successful. And all of a sudden, it became a very good chance that we would not make it. I would not say that I did a good job of handling it. The stress was overwhelming, and I did not do all that I could to turn it over to God, the worry and the stress became pretty overwhelming. It was complicated by other things going on in my life during the time, plus the church issues and things going on in the church caused a lot more stress. I stressed way too much, worried too much. But over my years in business, I've learned that one of the things that you can do to be critical in business, terminal in business, is to hide your head in the sand. I've always referred to it as an uh, ostrich syndrome. I own 12 businesses where people failed, and one of the things I noticed that people did the most to uh, cause that failure was to put their head in the sand and not address it. That's not my nature. I want to always do what I need to to attack the situation head on. So I've spent my life trying to learn from others' failures and other people's success and not to hide from the failures and to build and learn from the successes. I needed to motivate myself to get out of bed every day and do what I needed to do. And I tell you, there were a lot of days I just wanted to pull the covers over my head and lay in bed and cry or worry or be upset. But that's not the typical thing that I want to do, uh, but I understand it. One of the first things I did, Heather designed a, which those that know me know that this is kind of funny, a playlist. I have a rather diverse playlist of songs that are motivating and talking about overcoming stress and rising to the top. Uh, if you ask, I'll go over those personally, but they're kind of some of the titles and songs are embarrassing because you would not believe that I was listening to them. But I got to tell you that 45-minute uh, song track uh, plays a lot of times on the 14-hour trip from Florida. I've also been fascinated or paid attention to not only autobiographies and people's overcoming and being successful, but I like sayings, wise sayings. 
I've always been fascinated when someone says, well, my father used to always say, or my grandfather used to always say, or my mother used to always say, or my grandmother used to always say. They're called wise sayings for a reason. My father's dad used to say, if you can't say something positive, don't say anything at all. My mother's father was a member of the church and used to say, we're called to be a peculiar people. Always felt that was pretty easy for me. I like the idea of being peculiar or different from other people. But I've wondered what Jonathan and Heather and even Ellie might say when someone says, uh, what would your father say? Or what did your grandfather say? Or what, what lessons did you learn from them? And I've always had a lot of sayings. I, I, I have a lot of little things that guide my life and the decisions I made, make. And there's sayings I've stolen from people, learned, or through my trials and tribulations kind of come up with to help me get through situations. And those stories have been, and those sayings are something that I post a lot on Facebook and I remind myself to help overcome the stress and the struggles of today. And that's, again, why they're called wise sayings. There's wisdom in those. They come from people's learning, from coming through experiences, good and bad. Einstein said the only source of knowledge is experience. The goal is to learn from other people's experience for me because I don't have the time and don't want to make all the mistakes and live through all the trials that they have. To me, they are a reminder as to why I want to do things in a particular way or what, what I would call the right way. So I created my own wise saying to help me keep focus <clears throat> during these trials that we were going through. I remind myself of it all the time. Janie even bought me a picture that hangs in my room that says it. Heather even put it on my wallet for me. And as I look through my wallet, it says, it ain't easy, but it's worth it. So I remind myself of that all the time, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Hebrews, has, Hebrews 11 has what's called the Hall of Faith. I'm going to call this John's Hall of Overcoming or Learning from Trials and Tribulations and How to Handle It Best. I'm going to take a few lessons from Scripture. I'm sure that you'll have others that you can think of. And I think as I pull out and talk about the lessons I learned, there's more that you might be able to pull out of these stories. Uh, Bible examples. I'm sure that you might be able to make more um, meaningful lessons, but these are the ones I'm going to highlight. I want to talk about Adam. That's the first uh, story that I want. That's where the Bible starts. And really the Bible to me can be summed up in a lot of ways by saying it ain't easy, but it's worth it. Adam's living in a perfect garden. Life was great. He had everything he needed, all his wants and desires were taken care of. And he was told one thing, do not eat of the tree. That seems like a pretty easy thing for us. Or was it that easy? We could argue that or discuss that, and there's really probably no right answer. But it wasn't that easy for Adam, because Adam ate from the tree. If it was so easy, he wouldn't have done it. My lesson from that, was it may not seem like a big deal. It may not be something that seems important to you. But don't listen to bad advice. I know a lot of people had advice during this time, from family to friends to co-workers to franchisees. People had a lot of advice to me, and I needed to pay attention to do what I knew was right. I needed to do what God would expect me to do. And I think that's the lesson I get from Adam you know, as doing something that wasn't positive, I need to be careful not to do the wrong thing. Then I think about Noah. Noah was one of these stories that came up for me a lot as I was going through this and was reminded. Noah spent lots of time doing physical work, years and years of physical work, something that I would never want to do. Uh, I could never do it. It's a lot of work to do uh, uh to do a lot of things in life, but I can't imagine building something that big with no help and no support 
no friends, no, no one saying to you, I understand, or no one helping you, no one encouraging you. But he kept on working. He kept on. And one of the things that, in spite of the ridicule, he didn't listen to the bad, the things, the uh, problems that people brought out. He just kept on building. And that's the thing that, even though it must have seemed like forever, and no one was there to support him, Noah kept on building. And that's one of the things I kept telling myself every day, was keep on building. Keep on working. Don't stop. And the other thing that have patience for the plan to work out. Know that there's a reward. Keep on building. Don't stop working, even if you have no support. So that was my lessons from Noah. Job was another one that I spent a lot of time thinking about. Job was blessed beyond our understanding. He had things so good and so much and so plentiful. How could things be so good? Then just as quick, they became awful. He lost everything. His family, his possessions, his health. Everything was taken away from him. You know, one of the lessons that I took from that is it wasn't his fault. He was doing the right thing. He was the kind of person that God expected him to be. One of the things I hear when people go through the same situation I have been through is, I was doing the right thing. I wasn't doing anything wrong. And that's true. A lot of times we may be doing what we're supposed to do. And bad things can still happen to us. He lost his family. He lost his health. And he lost his fortune through no fault of his own. So bad things can happen to good people. We have to be ready for them. And it's not, it's not if they do. It's when they do, how do we handle it? He handled it so well that God gave it back to him. God blessed him greatly. And so to me, I thought about it. Although it's a struggle and it's a trial, I need to keep building. God's going to bless me greatly, whether it's in this life or in the future life. There will be big ups, there'll be big downs. There'll be big ups and there'll be big downs. It doesn't matter how righteous I am or how good, smart I am, or how talented I am, or how educated I am, there's going to be big ups, and there's going to be big downs in our life. Never give up on God. I may not understand, and two of my favorite verses about this and understanding God and God's will come from Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. God's ways are higher than mine. There's no way I can understand the plan that God has laid out for my life. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says the secret things belong to God. When I try to figure out why Job was blessed and then cursed and then blessed, I don't know. But I know that God has a plan and God has a way. And in the end, if I'm obedient and I'm faithful and I do the right thing, it will be worth it. It may not be easy as I go through it, but it will be worth it. Another one that I think about was Jonah and Nineveh. No matter what, he didn't believe it would work. He says, I'm not going to do this. It won't work. I'm wasting my time. And that's one of the things that I struggled with is, am I going to get through this? Am I going to be able to keep going? And I need to do what needs to be done, whether I believe that it's going to work or not. I need to do the right thing. I also think, thought about or think about Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. And I thought about the trials that they went through and how comforting it must have been to not be the only one, to have your friends there with you. 1 Corinthians 15, says, evil company corrupts good morals. Well, the opposite of that is true in a lot of cases, most cases, is good company creates, endorses, supports, inspires good behaviors. So having friends and people that love you and support you help you get through these trials. There wasn't a day that went by that I didn't get some kind of support from the people in this building, in this room, in this family to help me get through the trials and tribulations that I was going through. Constantly someone praying for me, someone there for me. And one of the things I take from 
Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. I need to be there for them, and I need to rely on them when I need them. The next lesson, Bible example, that I learned from is Peter. Peter was warned that he was going to do something. And how many times have we been told, don't do this or bad things are going to happen? And Peter knew it was going to happen. And that warning came from the greatest source, the most real, the most true source ever, that he was going to do something that he shouldn't. And he still gave in to peer pressure. And I can't do that. You can't do that. But the good news is, in spite of that embarrassment, in spite of letting Christ down, in spite of not standing up for the things that he needed to do, he went on to overcome it and be an important ambassador in the cause of Christ. So the humility to accept that you made a mistake, to get over the embarrassment, to overcome, is a great lesson that I take from Peter. Then Paul. Paul was jailed. He had physical problems. He had things that were a problem for him. And one of my first lessons I ever preached at this congregation was on my, one of my favorite thought processes in the Scripture. Paul focused on the worth it part. It will be worth it. He kept his eye on the prize, the prize at the end. That is what kept him going. And to, to be honest, if it wasn't for the prize that I know that lied ahead, that eternal life was there, I don't think I would have ever gotten through what I've been through. And I'm not sure any of us would. So keeping my eye on that prize, keeping my eye focused on that reward, the worth it part helps you get through the it ain't easy. Then the most important of all, Jesus. I cannot imagine ever leaving heaven. When I get there, I want to stay there. To leave the side of God, to leave with all authority, and to come to live life in a human form, a human body. That, that is beyond my ability to comprehend. To become a human from being God. To suffer the ridicule, the loneliness, and the physical pain for him. I do not understand how he could willingly do that. But he, better than me, thought it was worth it. It was worth it. I'm worth it. You were worth it. We may not understand it, but to Christ, all of that suffering, ridicule, loneliness, and physical pain were worth it for us to have that opportunity to go to heaven. Hard to understand, hard to have went through it, but it was worth it. The Bible covers, from cover to cover, tells us it ain't easy. It is worth it. We're going to have our ups and downs. Sometimes it will be our fault. Sometimes it will not be our fault. Sometimes we will have to go through things that take forever. We'll have to keep on plugging. We'll be embarrassed. We'll be by ourselves. We'll be with people. There'll be all kinds of situations that are going to be hard. God never said it was easy, but he said it's worth it. Revelation the end of the Bible, Revelation 2.10 says, Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Not a crown of life, the crown of life. I never realized that until I was reading this uh, yesterday. It's not a crown, it's the crown, the only crown, the kingdom. The entrance into heaven. That's what God's going to give us. There's only one heaven. And in that heaven, as it says in Revelation, there'll be no tears, no more disappointment, no temptations, no pain, no suffering. All will be made well. I just can't wait to be there. I'm, I'm inspired by the hope, the opportunity that I have to be in that place. 
the worth it is beyond all of my ability to understand. My ability to comprehend does not, does not match what heaven will be. So all of the problems and all the trials that we go through, heaven's worth it. A crown, the crown, that we will be given is worth all the pain and suffering here. All will be made well. It may not be easy to humble yourself to the point of obedience. I've not always understood what the problem with people wanting to be put into water to be baptized for the remission of their sins. I don't really understand why that's a barrier for some people, but I've seen it be a barrier to many people. Much like I don't see what was so hard about not eating in the garden for Adam. I don't see it, but it was. So it's a problem for some people. To believe, to confess, to repent, and to be baptized. It may be hard. It may be hard to, uh, to accept. It may be hard to understand. It may be hard to humble yourselves. I do not know what is standing in your way of being a New Testament Christian. It may not be easy for you. It's not easy for a lot of people, but it's worth it to overcome it. If you are not, now is the time to make that change in your life. Whatever it takes to become a New Testament Christian, that you could believe to confess that Jesus is the Son of God, to repent and to be baptized, and then understand that to get this reward, I need to overcome the obstacles and the it ain't easy part of life so I can have the worth part. If all of, as all of us in the past, we've struggled. We struggled with something in our walk with Christ. We've made mistakes. We've been disobedient. We've been forgetful, neglectful. Whatever that is, now is the time you've been given to humble yourself and ask for help to ask for support. Again, one of the lessons that I take from Meshach and Abednego and Shadrach is there's comfort in being together with God's people, with people that believe and think the way you do. To, to confess and ask for that support, to ask for that prayers, it is worth it. We're all on this road to heaven, and we want to get there. If you need to respond to the invitation, please come forward as we stand and sing.